Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with the episode of Way of the Underhive. This is a series that is dedicated to brand new players of Necromunda to help you guys learn the different tactics, rules, and systems for your favorite games as well as your favorite gang mechanics. So that being said, on today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a deep dive into the brand new Underhive Outcast Gang. So this gang is actually a brand new game mechanic that has came out with the latest release of Games Workshop's expansion to the Necromunda series, Necromunda the Book of the Outcasts. Now in that book, what ended up happening is that they gave you the ability to make what is known as an Underhive Outcast Gang, which gave you a whole huge a plethora of different options you can use to actually make gangs now for your campaigns of necromunda and if you're a brand new player to this game system and looking at these new outcast rules it can be extremely overwhelming especially if you're not sure about how to build a gang or what kind of things you should be looking for to create your gang and so the purpose of this video is to kind of help you know help you out with this and help you kind of build your own gangs so that way you can make your own outcast gang for your very first campaign necromunda now in this video we will talk about the underhive outcast gang strength as well as weaknesses we'll talk about the individual fighters they have for the underhive outcast leader as well as our champion as well as outcast hive scum we'll also talk about how you can use dramatis personae which are the special characters of necromunda in your games we are also talk about the delegation gangs and talk about the pros and cons of taking those for the guild delegations the criminal delegations as well as the noble house delegations and then finally we will give you five different uh, sorry not five six different lists that you can use just to illustrate the idea of how diverse you can make your gangs in this campaign setting with this new rule set that came out and of course because we'll be taking such a deep dive into this video i will put down timestamps down in the description box below so that way you can kind of jump around to the parts that are more important to you and uh, like i said before we'll be going through all this information so it's quite a bit so go and strap yourself in get ready to do a deep dive into the underhive with the outcast gang with your starting rosters so let's go and start our talk about the strengths of actually fielding an underhive outcast gang potentially they're one of the most powerful starting gangs in any campaign so if you're starting off a campaign brand new this could actually make you have a very powerful option the reason why is because you can actually get access to dramatis personae as leaders right from the start those are the special characters that the game system of necromunda actually has at the same time you can also take full advantage of using delegations to form the core of your gang right at the beginning of your game as well so if you don't want to take dramatis personae as your leaders you could take delegations and also help that as well. Delegations as well as Dramatis Personae, they both provide excellent equipment and skills right from the start as well. At the same time, you can take advantage of the brand new weird disciplines that have been released. Uh, there are six different weird disciplines that you can use for your uh, psychers, for your gangs now, and so that's really awesome as well. At the same time, this is potentially one of the cheapest gangs to field as well, because if you already own a house gang of some sort, or maybe you already purchased a house gang, you can easily turn them into an outcast gang, and they have some special rules attached to them as well. So if you already have a gang, you don't need to buy any more miniatures, you can just use whatever you have have as well at the same time the fighters are actually cheap in terms of points as well so you can have very pretty large uh, outcast gangs to def uh, overwhelm enemy with numbers and at the same time because of the variety of things that you can use to build this game diversity is the spice of life when it comes to the outcast gangs so for example if you're really looking forward to having some really intricate combination of things in your outcast gang this is the gang that you want to play so let's go ahead and talk about the weakness of playing an outcast gang. First of all, if you play an outcast gang, they are extremely limited in their alliance choices that they can make. So if you're one of those players who want to make alliances quite regularly in your campaign system, this might not be the gang for you because depending on what kind of affiliation you choose for your gang, it also depends what kind of alliances they can make. Uh, we talked a little, about, a little about this when we did our deep dive on my review for the Book of the Outcast in a previous video. So that's something you gotta take, in, uh, take, in, uh, take into account when you make your gang for the very first time at the same time this gang is also really potentially expensive in terms of money okay so if you're one of those kind of people that want to play let's say in a sponsored event where you can only use games workshop miniatures this could be kind of expensive because forge rule miniatures as you guys are well aware are extremely expensive for us especially here in the united states because we have to pay for shipping and handling for international rates so because of that if you want to use official made miniatures from games workshop and from forge world it could cost you a lot of money to do this me i'm a cheapskate so i don't care about that so i'll use whatever i want to, to 
to proxy things. But for those who are really into that uh, into that aspect of actually owning official miniatures, and I can understand the appeal because those miniatures are beautiful, um, it could be expensive for you to play this game. At the same time, this also could be potentially one of the most expensive games to field on the battlefield in terms of points, because if you go with delegations, for example, they eat up a large chunk of your points to make up a gang, so your gang could start off as being kind of small if you decide to do that as well. At the same time, the delegation gangs, when they wrote the rules for these guys, there actually are some questions that a lot of gamers have because they don't actually go into a lot of detail or they don't even address this problem. For example, some individual fighters don't have point values attached to them, and a really big question is, if you make a delegation gang, do they get the special rules from their various guild, criminal, and noble house delegations? Do they get those special rules attached to them? They really don't address that in the rules, so it's really up to your arbitrator. So because of that, um, if you are going to decide to do an outcast gang, these are just some things you might want to bring in with your arbitrator for your campaign to see how they're going to rule on these things. But I'll talk about exactly what I do for my campaigns with my players as an arbitrator uh, later on in the video when we talk about it. So now that we're done talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the outcast gang, let's go ahead and talk about the individual fighters starting off with the Underhive outcast leader. All right, first of all, let's go ahead and talk about the Underhive Outcast Leader. Now, this character is going to be perhaps the most important character within your gang because your Underhive Outcast Leader sets the tone and the abilities and the alliances that your gang can make as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about real quick before we talk about anything else, let's go ahead and talk about the stats for this character. So this character costs 125 credits, and you basically have four different stats, kind of like a Venator gang, that you can choose from to make your gang leader, okay? Now, I basically broke them down into four types of stats. You have what I like to call the Xeno stat, uh, the Versatile stat, the Close Combat stat, as well as the Resilient stat. So let's go on and talk about that real quick. So for the uh, Xeno stats, you have a looking at a movement characteristic of 7 inches, weapon skill of 4+, plus, ballistic skill of 2+. Plus. They have 3 strength, 3 toughness, 2 wounds, 3 plus initiative, 2 attacks, 5 plus leadership, 4 plus cool, 7 plus willpower, and 5 plus intelligence. So this is a really good psychological stat line for, to use for your character as well, especially if you want to make him to like a, a psyker that can use weird powers. At the same time, these guys are really good at shooting as well, and they are wicked fast. They move 7 inches. These are, you know, by far one of the fastest moving players that they have. So, for example, if you're a fan of using Eldar miniatures in your games of Warhammer 40,000, this will actually be very familiar for you guys. Now, the versatile stat line is pretty good as well. They have a movement characteristic of 6 inches, they have 3 plus weapon skill, 3 plus ballistic skill, 3 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 3 plus initiative, 3 attacks, they have 6 leadership, 7 cool, 6 willpower, as well as 4 intelligence. Now, in my opinion, this is probably the best stat to use for an outcast leader if you decide to go with a generic leader for your gang. And the reason why is because, like the name says, it's very versatile. They got really good psychological stats. They got decent close combat and, and shooting stats. They got good wounds, and they got three attacks, which makes them really good in close combat. And they have movement characteristic of six, so you could kick this guy out any way you want to. Like the name suggests, he's very, very versatile. Next, you have what's called the Close Combat stat line. This character has a 5-inch wound allowance. They have 2-plus weapon skill, 4-plus ballistic skill, 4 strength, 3 toughness, 2 wounds, 4-plus initiative, 3 attacks, 6 leadership, 6 cool, 4 willpower, as well as 7 intelligence. And as the name suggests, these guys are really good at close combat. With a 2-up weapon skill and a 4 strength and base, and three attacks, these guys are going to be chewing through anything that you throw in their way as well. So you, if you're looking for a really aggressive close combat leader, this is the stat line for you. And then lastly, we have what's called the Resilient stat line. This one's actually got a 4-inch movement allowance, 3-plus weapon skill, 4-plus ballistic skill. They have 3 strength, 4 toughness, 3 wounds, 5-plus initiative, 2 attacks, 6-plus leadership, 4-plus cool, 6-plus willpower, and 5-plus intelligence. So the resilient stat line is exactly what the name stands for. They got a four, uh, they have four toughness right off the bat. They also have three wounds, which means that they are actually carrying one more wound than most gang leaders have, which is absolutely fantastic as well. Now they do have that four inch wound allowance, which is kind of sad, but at the same time though, with this guy with the resilience that he has, this individual is going to be able to survive at whatever you're throwing at him. So because of that, that is really, really helpful as well. Now, at the same time, you do have to address what are called archetypes and affiliations. We talked about this in my previous video that I did last week on my deep dive on the book of the Outcast. Just to let you know, you have basically six different archetypes you can use, which determine what kind of skills you can take. So you have to look at it. For example, brawler skills, uh, brawler archetype, for example, concentrates mainly on brawn for their skills. The weird archetype allows you to use the weird powers that are now available for psychers, that sort of thing. And same 
something with your affiliations. Your affiliations will basically determine what kind of alliances you can make. So for example, if you choose a clanless affiliation, for example, you don't have any alliance options whatsoever. Whereas if you're a delegation alliance of some sort, delegation affiliation, you can only make your alliance with the specific delegation you're from. So for example, if you're a water guild delegation gang, you can only make alliances with the water guild, for example. And then of course you also have what are known as your house uh, outcasts, and those guys can only make alliances with the ones that are from their individual books as well. And like I said before, these guys are very, very diverse in their stat lines, so these guys can fulfill a lot of roles depending on how you want to equip them, and so because of this, pretty much kind of limitless in the things that you can do with your gang leader. So now that we're done talking about the gang leader, let's go ahead and talk about the champion. So the champion, of course, costs 60 credits for the uh, outcast, the underhive outcast champion, and this is just for the basic generic champion that you can get for your gang. This individual has five inch movement, three plus weapon skill, four plus ballista skill. They have three strength and toughness, two wounds, four plus initiative, one attack. They have six leadership, seven cool, eight willpower, as well as eight intelligence. So they only have one set of stats, and it's kind of like it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Orlock Road Sergeant. The way that they're kind of kitted out with their stat line and that's what it kind of reminds you of as well which is kind of nice because it is means that these characters are kind of di are diverse in the way you want to use them that three plus weapon skill four plus weapon skill makes them pretty good at shooting as well as in close combat as well so that's the nice part about that now however though there are some drawbacks to the outcast champion one of the big things that they have is of course just like your leader you do have to pick your your archetype and you have, once again, five archetypes you can choose from, which are Brawler, Gunslinger, Survivor, Mastermind, as well as Weird. However, their archetypes are kind of limited in the skills that they can take, in my opinion. Um, usually, most other gangs that are not outcast gangs, they have two primary skills they can choose from, uh, and as well as, uh, I think, like four secondaries they can choose from in most cases. These guys, though, they only have one primary skill they can choose, two secondaries. So because that is kind of limited on kind of skills they can take as well. At the same time, their starting equipment is limited by rarity value of up to eight at the max on the training post. So while that is kind of nice because they get the access to the entire training post, most, they're only limited to rarity 8. Bolt guns, for example, are rarity 8. So there's not a lot of weapons you can actually equip these guys with that are really, really powerful or really, really strong right off the bat. So because of that, that is kind of limiting. However, though, like I said before, they're extremely diverse. They can fill a lot of different roles depending on how you want to equip them. And the best part about this gang is that they can take one champion for every three hive scum that they have in their gang. So I can understand why they kind of limited their skills in that sense, as well as the weapons they can take right off the bat. Because if you can take one champion for every three hive scum, you're talking about a lot of champions in your gang. So, what it looks like from the way that they want to design the 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 most basic generic outcast gang, it's a numbers game. You have more numbers than your opponents, and you should act accordingly. All right. So up next, we have the under hive outcast hive scum. So. One of the big things about these guys, which is really, really cool, is that their miniatures are absolutely beautiful. If you look at this picture in the background, they have some amazing miniatures with these guys as well. In fact, a lot of people are just interested in these miniatures rather than actually building a gang. But let's go on and talk about them real quick. So these are your Hive Scum. You know them. You love them. You see them all the time in different gangs. They cost 30 credits apiece. They have 5-inch movement, 4-plus weapon scum, plus a skill, 3 strength and toughness, 1 wound, 4 initiative, 1 attack, 8 leadership, 8 cool, 8 willpower, and 8 intelligence. And pretty much they're very much similar to Orlock Gunners in, the, in their stat line. So because of that, like Orlock Gunners, they're pretty versatile. Whatever you can use them for, you can put them in close combat or shooting, and they do that equally well because they're kind of like generic in that sense. Now, when it comes to their skills, however, their skills are kind of limited, um, especially if they actually get the specialist trait. You get the cunning for your pri primary skill and ferocity for secondary, so those are the only two skills you can use. Granted, cunning could have some really cool combinations as well as ferocity, but it's kind of lackluster, all things considered. At the same thing, time, the, another thing that's kind of negative about the Outcast Hive Scum is that if you decide to take a specialist in your gang, because you're allowed to do so, um, they can't take any special weapons at the start. When you look at their equipment list, their equipment list is pretty generic. So because of that, they don't have any special weapons uh, uh, available to them at that point. And so because of that, they're not going to be as well equipped as other gangs. But like I said, the reason why that is the case is because the lower credit amount that you t that these guys cost, that's where the trade-off is. So while you might not be able to get better equipment as opposed to other gangs that are out there, you have numbers on your side. So because of that, you could have a whole horde of high scum if you just bare bones equip them to fight your opponents. So that's the nice thing about that. Another thing that's really nice about this rule book as well, when it came to the book of Outcast, they actually identify the Hive Scum as both a ganger level fighter as well as a juvie level fighter as well. So whenever you run into those situations where, you know, they talk about juvie uh, rules attached to those juvie class fighters, 
You don't need to worry about that because uh, your high skill count is both, which is actually kind of nice as well. And not to mention, did I mention the miniatures look really cool? They look really cool as well. So now that we're done talking about the Hive Scum for the generic characters, let's talk about some of the extra things you can do beyond just what the generic stat lines you have for your generic fighters by talking about how you can use Dramatis Persona in your gangs as well as using Delegations in your gangs as well. So first of all, let's talk about Dramatis Personae. The Dr Dramatis Personae are the special characters that are available for you in the various publications of Necromunda. And the nice thing about this is that you can actually use them to be the leader of your gang. So for example, if there's a special character that you like, for example, like uh, Apollo's Cage, for example, who's a Orlock bounty hunter, for example, if you want to use him for the leader of your gang, you can do that. If you want to use Cal Jericho as the leader of your gang, as this picture shows, you could do that too. It's really, really cool because by using these Dramatis Personae characters to be the leader of your gang, they start off with really good stats, they start off with really good equipment and skills, they also have special rules attached to them as well, which is awesome. And not only that, but when you take these Dramatis Personae on as the leaders of your gang, you can choose which archetype you want to give them, so that way they could use the different skills that they have, as well as their affiliation. So it's just kind of like a building up on how awesome these guys are really cool, uh, really are. And the best part about these fighters is that once you start using them in your gang, they can gain experience, they can upgrade over time with different stats. At the same time, they can also purchase new weapons and equipment, which is really, really cool. So you can do some pretty amazing combinations with things as the time goes on. Now, what will this look like over the long term? We really don't know because the product has just been released. So we don't really know what's going to happen to year from now of how, what kind of combinations people are going to pull out with but there's some really cool things that you could possibly do with this and i'm really looking forward to see exactly what people assemble when it comes to these uh with the, using these dramatis personae within their gangs so that's just the first thing so if you decide to take a dramatis personae as your leader of your gang you don't get the underhive outcast leader because that character is no longer that character is no longer available to you because the dramatis personae is being used as your leader for the most part and that's how it works with that so keep that in mind uh, when you actually decide to choose this special character now let's go and talk about delegation gangs real quick so another neat mechanic about the book of the outcast is that you could use guild criminal or noble house delegations to form the core of your gang as well which is really really cool and in fact the book actually breaks down then point values you know what the leader of the delegation costs what the champion of the delegation costs what their gangers uh, count out as well so that part is really nice not to mention, if you decide to pick a delegation as the core of your gang, the leader of that delegation becomes a gang leader. They get to choose an archetype of your choice as well as affiliation. Now your affiliation, of course, will depend on what delegation you use. So for example, going back to that Water Guild example, if you decide to take the Water Guild's uh, Nautican Siphoning delegation to form the core of your gang, your gangs could be affiliated with the Water Guild, for example, okay? Or let's say, for example, you decided to take the Rogue Factoria from the Criminal Alliances as the delegation you want to choose for the core of your gang, then that ends up happening is that that will be your affiliation is with the, uh, with the uh, Rogue Factoria, for example. At the same time, your champions also get to choose archetypes as well, which is really nice. And the best part about these guys, these guys also level up just like Dramatis Personae, just like any other fighter. You could also purchase new equipment for them as well. So because of that, that part is really, really cool too. So there's a lot of cool things about Delegation Gangs. Now, there is one drawback. Actually, there's two drawbacks with Delegation Gangs. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail later, though. But one of the big drawbacks we have, of course, is that they don't get any alliances. All right. So if you decide to use a Delegation to form the core of your gang, you cannot make any alliances of any sort whatsoever what you have is what you get and that is all you get so you don't get any more alliances beyond that and the second problem that you run into is because your book doesn't really the book doesn't really talk about it too much is through the special rules from those delegations um does the gang get those special rules so for example one of the big ones of course is like the house of iron uh, the, the guild of iron for example does the guild of iron if you decide to take that as an outcast gang do you get that minus two to the rarity values of weapons that you can get at the training post do you get that discount to the weapons that you get as well from the training post that's a thing that needs to be discussed between you and your arbitrator i could see how some arbitrators would say no to those to those special rules and narratively it would make sense if they decide to say no because it's a represent the fact that your delegation let's say you're from the iron guild you're an outcast from the iron guild which means you got kicked out of your guild so that special rule should not be attached to you uh because it represents the fact that you're an outcast so if you're if your arbitrator decides to rule against that saying no you don't get the special rules narratively it does make sense However, for me though, because I subscribe to the rule of cool for my game, for my uh, players and for my campaigns, I told my friends, no, you get the special rule as well. Maybe you guys are not necessarily kicked out of your guild. Maybe you're being sent out to establish something out in the out in the, out in the wastelands. 
so I'll let you keep the special rule. Like I said before though, if you decide to use Outcast Gang, it's very important as a new player to have that dialogue with your Arbitrator. Your Arbitrator will tell you what the kind of things they'll allow, what they won't allow in the campaign. It's very, very much a relationship that you need to establish with the Arbitrator, so keep that in mind, okay? So depending on your Arbitrator rules on that, it's entirely up to them. So first of all, the first of the delegations we're going to talk about real quick are the guilds. So once again, the merchant guilds are available on this one. And like I said before, all the different guilds have different things attached to them as well when it comes to their point values, except for a couple. Okay, so for example, the Wandering Scum from the Iron Guild, for example, that delegation is not listed in the book. They don't tell you what their point values are or you know what members are what. So I'm assuming that if you make a Wandering Scum gang from the Iron Guild, you just make a normal Outcast gang because normally when you take that alliance, you just get five up to D3 plus two uh, Hive Scum anyways. So I'm assuming that's what it is. You just make a normal Outcast gang using the generic list and then of course the special rules attached to that guild delegation would be given to your Wandering Scum if your arbitrator allows that to happen. For example, another one, for example, is a pyromantic conclave. Your pyromantic conclave costs actually 450 credits to fill this group. Your pyro sing, pyro king lord is your leader. He costs 140 credits. Your power major is your champion. He costs 222, uh, 222, 20 credits. And then you get two cinders, which are ganger class fighters, and they cost 45 credits a piece there. Next, you have the Nautican Siphoning Delegation. Uh, these guys are cost you 435 credits for this group. You get one Master Nautican, who is the leader. He costs 185 credits. You get one Siphon Knight, who's your champion, who costs 90 credits. And you have one Subnautican, who's a ganger. He costs 160 credits for that fighter. After that, you have what's called the Slave Entourage from the uh, from the uh, Slave Guild. Uh, your ch that group costs you 710 credits for that group. Your Chain Lord, who's the leader of your gang, uh, he costs 280 credits. Your Shackleman, who's your champion, costs 190 credits. And your two pit fighters are gangers, and they cost you 120 credits apiece for those guys. Now, from the Corpse Guild, you have the Corpse Harvesting uh, Party. That's going to cost you 550 credits for those guys. The Pale Consort's your leader for that delegation. That person costs 160 credits. The Bone Scrivener is your champion, costs 120 credits for that guy. And you get two Corpse Grinders, who cost you 135 credits apiece for that one. And then lastly, you have your Toll Collectors. These guys are from the uh, the House of the Guild of Coin. They cost you 520 credits. Your Master of Coin will be your leader. That person costs 245 credits. Your Skin Flint is your champion, who costs 125 credits. And then your Groveler is, you get two Grovelers. Those are your Gangers, and they cost 75 credits apiece. And so that's what you would get from your core delegation if for your Guild Delegation Gangs. All right, so up next, we're going to talk about the, uh, the criminal delegations as well. So this one's kind of interesting because there's actually a lot of members of this delegate of the criminal delegations that are represented. For example, the Narco Lords, for example. Uh, Narco Lords are not included in this list. So I'm assuming that the Narco Lords are much like the Guild of Iron. You just make a normal outcast gang. Uh, just because in the previous editions, when you got Narco Lord alliances, you got D3 plus 2 Hive Scum anyway. So I'm just assuming that you just make a normal outcast gang and they just have the Narco Lords uh, affiliation. And at the same time, because I allow the, uh, the delegations to actually have their special rules from their rule books, um, the Narco Lords would get that. All right. So that would be used that, for example. Now, one of the most, one of the most impressive ones, of course, is the Smuggler short party from the coal traders everyone's favorite uh, criminal alliance uh, those guys cost 600 credits your coal trader will be your leader that person costs 215 credits the bosun will be your champion that individual costs 85 credits and of course your two voidborn scum are gangers and you get those 150 credits a piece after that you get your factoria work gang from the uh from the uh, rogue factoria uh, criminal Alliance. Those guys cost you 315 credits. You have your Factoria Overseer. That person costs 160 credits. Will be the leader of your delegation. You have your Work Party Boss, who's your champion. Uh, that person costs 80 credits, and you get three Factoria Workers, 25 credits apiece. So that one's the the less expensive of all of them. Now, the other three. Now these ones are actually kind of interesting because they don't list the Master Charlatan from the Imperial Posters or the Rebel Lord from the Fallen House or the Mind Locked Weird from the Psy Syndica. So I'm not sure of what these guys would cost because they're not actually included in the book. Now the book says, the rule book and I quote, this is what the rule book says, the rule book says uh, choose a delegation listed below, right? And it says individual fighters are included for the purpose of the gang roster and fighter cards. You cannot hire them separately. Now, some delegations are single models, such as the Fallen Nobles, and as such should be added using the rules for elevating a fighter to leader status. And now, if you look at the elevated fighter leader status, they don't tell you how much that person costs, so I'm not really sure exactly how that would actually work out, to be perfectly honest. So because of that, I'm not really sure what the situation would be for those delegations if you decide to use them um, for these guys. So I'm assuming, I just tell my players that you just 
pay the 120 credits for a normal outcast leader because there are no rules about how you how much these guys would cost for your gang so that that's where it gets a little bit kind of weird and a little hinky with the um with the rules that they've written so far so that's the thing you need to worry about so like i said it's up to your arbiter how they want to do it um i know there are some people out there like goonhammer for example which is one of the uh blogs that actually talks about necromunda i know a lot of players have actually att attached credit rankings for all these fighters in case they want to make their games more balanced you could use that uh it's up to you how you and your arbitrator want to do things so i would have that conversation with your arbitrator to see how you want to do it for those guys as well that's for the master charlatan the rebel lord as well as the mind locked weird so you have to talk to your players about exactly how that's going to work out all right, so the last noble house, uh, most delegation we're talking about now are the noble house delegations. So for the house catalyst carnival, that's going to cost you 320 credits for those guys. Your mass killer costs 425, while your mind fried uh, costs 75. After that, you have the house Ulanti court advisors. Those guys cost you 460 credits. The Ulanti courtier costs 235 credits, while the mirror mask costs 225. After that, you have the House Grey Military Attaché. That costs you 330 credits for those guys. The Kriegmaster will be the leader. He costs 240 credits, while the Jaegerkin is a ganger. That person costs 90 credits. After that, you have the House Co-Iron Ministorum Delegation. Uh, that uh, costs you 500 credits for that. Your Prime Materis, she'll be your leader for one uh, for 300 credits for that character. While your two Fraterus Bodyguards will be gangers, and they cost you 100 credits for those guys. After that, you have the House Renlo Auditing Conclave. Uh, those guys will cost you 370 credits for them. Your Renlo Auditor will be the leader of your gang. That person costs 180 credits, while the Guilt Scrivener uh, costs 190 credits for that character. And then lastly, you have the House Tie on Miyoto Coven. Uh, those guys will be costing 300 credits for those. Your Anmyoto Telepath will be the leader of your gang, costs 125 credits. And your Anmyoto Noel, which will be a ganger, will cost you 175. And to be perfectly honest with you guys, um, if I had to choose a noble house, I'd probably choose the house Tai Anmyoto Coven. Just because of all the new rules that you have for your psychic abilities and weird powers now in this edition, with this rule set coming out, I can see you using a really powerful uh, uh, abilities from that as well. So that's just my personal pick for that one. So now that we're done talking about the noble house delegations and all the delegation gangs that you can actually take with your gangs, next thing we're now to talk about are the actual gang lists that we would actually recommend. We actually have six gang lists in this video, and the reason why is because of the variety of things you can make. So well, let's go ahead and get it on to it and get a deep, deep dive on those gangs. All right, so the first gang build that we're going to give you guys is what I like to call the Clanless Outcast Gang. This is the Mercator Umbras. So let's talk about these guys. You'll spend a thousand credits on these guys. It consists of two fire teams. You have one support fire team and one assault fire team. Your support fire team will consist of your champion number one, hive scum number one, hive scum number two, hive scum number three, and hive scum number four. Your support team uses long range fire to suppress your enemy, which is good for medium to close range, and you use smoke grenades to mask your approach of your assault fire team. Now, your assault fire team will consist of Hagar Freelord, which is the new Dramatis Personae that came out in this book, as well as Champion number two, Hive Scum number five, and Hive Scum number six. Your assault fire team closes in and flanks your enemy to destroy them and use smoke grenades once again to mask your approach to do so. Now, there is an option on this one. Champion number two, you do have a second option for this guy. You can make this guy into a big gun assassin instead if you want to. When that guy can use infiltrate the list to go in and assassinate people, so it's up to you how you want to do it. Now, this list is kind of nice because it takes a advantage of the Dramatis Personae for a leader rule that you can use, especially with this character, Hagar Freeload. He has what's called ex Gilder Armory Special Rule, which will be nice because that really helps you equip the members of your gang with better weapons. At the same time, there's a good way to make additional money very quickly. Uh, this character, Hagar Freelord, automatically generates D6 times 10 credits at the end of every scenario that he survives in, and if you equip him the way I do with the Fixture Special Rule, this guy also gives you additional D3 times 10 credits as well, so long as he's not taken out of action. And the, if you notice as well in this list, the entire gang are all equipped with respirators. And the reason why that is the case is because if you decide to play an, uh, an, out, an Outlander campaign, uh, environmental effects from the bad zones, from the Book of Peril, will take place in your scenarios. And so having those respirators will help your gang to survive whatever environmental effects they might be walking into. So let's go ahead and talk about exactly who makes up this list. So first of all, you're going to have Hagar Freelord. He costs 180 credits. He's the Dramatis Personae from this book. He's equipped with two plasma pistols, as well as a respirator and mesh armor, and he automatically comes with the Overseer skill. You're going to give this guy the Mastermind archetype, so that way he can get the Fixer skill, so that way he can earn additional D3 times 10 credits. This guy is no slouch in close combat or with shooting. He's got two plasma pistols as well, so this guy is going to be really, really good to use for your gang, especially for generating income for your gang as well. 
After that, you have Underhive Outcast uh, Champion number one. This guy's going to cost you 160 credits. He's got a grenade launcher, mesh armor, smoke grenade, stub gun, as well as a respirator. He's also got the mastermind archetype, so that way he can get the overwatch skill. So this guy will be interrupting your opponents with the grenade launchers with frag and crack grenades, using smoke grenades to cover your screening as you're moving through. Very, very important character. Now, Underhive Outcast Champion number two. This guy will cost you 160 credits. This guy is armed with a stub gun plasma combo pistol, as well as mesh armor. He's got dum dum rounds for a stub gun, a chain sword, as well as a respirator as well. Now, this character originally is going to have the mastermind archetype, so that way he can use the infiltrate skill, so that way he can be a big gun assassin if you want to. You can infiltrate in take on opponents or if you don't want that you want to keep him with the rest of your gang i'd give him the brawler archetype and give him bull charge that way he gets that additional buffs to his close combat attacks as well now after that you have hive skill number one and two these two guys are equipped exactly the same there are 105 credits apiece they're armed with bolt guns stub guns as well as respirators then you have high scum three and four who are equipped exactly the same both of them are going to cost you 65 credits they're armed with auto guns stub guns as well as respirators now these four guys will be doing most of your long range shooting from medium to close range they'll be doing the most of the support elements doing that suppressive fire with your hunt champion with your champion number one who's going to actually lead those guys Meanwhile, Hive Skill number 5 is going to cost 80 credits. He's got a shotgun, stub gun, and respirator. And Hive Skill number 6 has 70 credits. That person's got twin stub guns, smoke grenades, and respirator. These guys will be tagging along with your champion number 2, as well as Hagar Freelord to be your assault element. The Hive Skill number 6 will be lobbing smoke grenades to cover your advance. That way you can flank your opponent, catch him in a crossfire, and destroy him that way. So there you guys have it. This is what's going to be the clanless outcast gang, also known as Mercator Umbrus is what we call it, because that's what the uh, gang leader's group is called and so it's kind of a narrative choice for these guys all right the second game that we're going to present to you guys is a nurgle corrupted corpse harvesting party that's going to cost you a thousand points that is right this is going to be a corpse delegate corpse party harvesting party that has been corrupted by nurgle you can use nurgle's corrupting influence to give this gang an edge for the pell consort as well as have chaotic support it, it also kind of shows you the diversity of gangs that you can build with these new outcast rules use chaos to help uh, add buff to your gang and combine with the guild's special rules on wounds and it pretty much makes this gang unstoppable it's probably Primarily a close quarters combat oriented gang. You do have two fire teams on this one. You have a support fire team as well as an assault fire team. Your support fire team will consist of the repel consort as well as your outcast champion as well as hive scum number one and hive scum number two. These guys provide suppression fire and long range shooting. You're going to spam the pel consort's overseer skill on the champion so that way that character can shoot up to four times with their plasma gun because that champion's got the fast shot trait with their plasma gun. After that, you have your Assault Fire Team. Your Assault Fire Team will consist of your Bone Scrimmer, Corpse Grinder number one, Corpse Grinder number two, as well as Hive Scum number three. Your Bone Scrimmer spams the Fast Shot ability with your Grenade Launcher, suppressing enemies with frag, crack grenades, as well as providing cover for advance with smoke grenades. And your Corpse Grinders will slay in close combat alongside your Hive Scum number three, and Hive Scum number three is a bullet mag to protect your other fighters because, you know, you could easily replace this guy. So let's talk about exactly what these guys are equipped with. So Pale Consort's gonna cost you 160 credit. This individual's got a last pistol, fighting knife, meta skull, as well as respirator and mesh armor. They have the fearsome as well as the overseer ability as well. Now they get plus one added to their wounds because they are a Nurgle uh, corrupted gang, so you get that for your leader, so that's gonna be really nice to help out your Pell Consort. You're gonna give your Pell Consort a weird archetype, so that way they can use the Biomancy Discipline to give them the stop bleeding ability, which allows them to remove flush wounds off of their uh, off of their fellow gang members as well. So this is gonna really help you with healing, and as you get more powers in the Biomancy abilities, you'll make your fear fighters even stronger. Now your Bone Scrimmer, this guy's gonna cost 240 credits, and the reason why is because this person's armed with a grenade launcher as well as smoke grenades. They have a Stiletto Knife, a Gun Skull, a Respirator. They are also got a Cult Icon, and you're also gonna equip this person with Mesh Armor. They have the Fearsome Rule, and they're gonna have the Gunslinger Archetype, and you're gonna give them the Fast Shot Ability, so that way the Bone Scrimmer can shoot twice with their grenade launcher. At the same time, their Gun Skull will also be able to follow up with two shots as well at the same target that you shoot at as well, so that part's kinda cool. After that, you're going to have an Outcast Champion. This person's going to cost you 185 credits. This person's armed with a plasma gun. They have a stub gun with dum-dum rounds for a backup weapon as well as mesh armor. They're also going to have the Gunslinger Archetype as well. And you're giving Fast Shot for this person too. So that way, when you combine that with Overseer from your Pale Consort, this fighter can actually shoot four times with a Rapid Fire Plasma Gun, which is... I cannot begin to describe to you how awesome that combination really is. 
Now for the rest of your gang, Corpse Grand number 1 and 2 are equipped exactly the same. They're going to cost you 145 credits. They have chain glaives and flak armor, but you're going to purchase auto pistols for them as well, so that way they can do some close range shooting. And of course, they have the crushing blow skill already attached to them as well. Now Hive skill number two, 1 and 2 are equipped exactly the same. They cost you 4 or 5 credits apiece. They're armed with last guns. So these guys are going to be part of your support fire team, shooting with your bone scrimmer to lay down suppressive fire. While Hive skill number 3 is going to cost you 35 credits, and he's equipped the stub gun, so that way he can attract bullets to his to his area so that way it leaves your gang pretty much free to you know advance forward and not to worry about your other guys getting shot at and that pretty much makes up what i like to call the nurgle corrupted corpse harvesting party all right so list number three is what i like to call cal's heroes this is a house ulanti outcast game that's going to cost you 1000 points it's primarily a shooting game that can do lots of damage in close combat as well it really spams the dramatis personae in this list as well you're taking cal jericho for example and according to the lore cal jericho is the uh, illegitimate son of house helmwar of house ulanti who's the lord of uh, necromunda so this kind of fits narratively as well which is kind of cool now you can actually consist of four fire teams in this gang you have two sniper teams, sniper team one and two. You have an assault team as well as a big gun assassin in this list. Now, sniper team number one consists of champion number one and hive skill number five. These guys provide overwatch and long range fire suppression and does exactly the same thing with sniper team number two. Consists of champion number two as well as hive skill number six. They do exactly the same thing as well. Now, your assault fire team, which is the biggest portion of your gang, will consist of Cal Jericho as well as hive skill number one, two, and three and four. They're going to close the distance between themselves as well as, well as their enemies and assault forward. Hive skill number three and four can provide medium to close range suppression with their guns, while it's Cal Jericho, scum number one, and scum number two close in and destroy people in close combat. And then finally, you have your big gun assassin. That's going to be Scabs, which is the other dramatis persona in this gang. He's going to infiltrate and blast away with his plasma gun. So let's go on and talk about exactly who's going to be in this gang. So first of all, your leader is going to be Cal Jericho. He's going to cost you 340 credits for this character. He's a special character. He's got two mastercrafted hotshot last pistol, a dueling saber, filter plugs, a strip clip, a strip kit, as well as flak armor. He's got the counterattack, gunslinger, inspiration spring up and step aside skills you're going to give him the gunslinger archetype because narratively speaking it's going to fit his personality and instead of giving him actually a shooting skill you're going to use the leadership skill instead and giving commanding presence so that way he can group activate more fighters now because cal jericho automatically comes with the ability to hire scabs for under credits you're going to hire scabs Scab's another secondary special character that you can take with this gang. This guy's got a plasma gun as well as a stub gun with dum-dum rounds. You're to purchase that for him, so that way he's got a little bit better survivability in close combat. He's got filter plugs as well as flak armor. He's got the clamber, escape artist, and infiltrate special rule. This is your big gun assassin. Have him infiltrate in and blast at people with that plasma gun of his. Now after that, you have two outcast champions. Champion number one is going to cost you 115 credits. This guy has a long last rifle, as well as mesh armor, a stug and dum dum rounds, as well as filter plugs. He's also got the gunslinger archetype with fast shot, so that way you can shoot twice. He's going to be one of your snipers, and you're going to pair him up with one of your hive scums armed with the last gun as well. Outcast champion number two is going to cost you 125 credits. This guy's got a long rifle as well as mesh armor. He's got a stub gun with dum dum rounds as well as filter plugs, and he's also got the fast shot. Uh, gunslinger art type as well so that way you can do some long range shooting and suppress your opponents after that you guys have your hive scum hive scum number one is going to cost you 70 credits armed with a shotgun as well as an axe hive scum number two is costs you 60 credits you got a chainsaw as well as a stub gun so those two will make up your assault team with cal jericho Hive skill number three and four are equipped exactly the same. They cost you 50 credits apiece. They both have auto guns as well as stub guns. And once again, their job is to assault forward. The auto gun gives them rapid fire from medium to close range shooting. The stub gun's a backup weapon for close combat. And then finally, you have hive skill number five and six. Both these guys cost 45 credits apiece. They're both equipped with last guns. And their whole purpose is to stick with their champions to provide long range suppression with their last guns and to support their champions. The champions are going to be the real killers with the long range shooting. The hive skills will provide security for them with the last gun and also do some long range sniping as well so this is our very narrative inspired uh, out, uh house ulanti outcast gang called cal's heroes all right from there we're going to talk about what we like to call the we rule the night shore smuggling party so this is going to cost you 1000 points it is a cold traders delegation gang it is primarily a shooting game but they can also throw down in close combat as well and what they're going to use they're going to use weird powers to spam the blackout conditions on the battlefield allowing your gang to close the distance and attack your opponent as well and to make sure that this game mechanic works the entire gang is outfitted with photo goggles so that way they can shoot in the darkness and fight in the darkness while this is occurring it's absolutely terrifying 
terrifying what this game could do. It consists of three fire teams. You have a support fire team, an assault fire team, as well as a big gun assassin in this gang as well. Your support fire team will consist of your cold trader as well as hive skull number one and hive skull number two. You're providing medium to close range suppression fire and at the same time your cold trader will spam the overcharge weird power to boost the strength of the hive skull weaponry that's with this little fire team as well. Or their own weaponry which is actually kind of nice. Like I said, pretty terrifying to contemplate when these guys are shooting you in the dark. Your opponents can't see you, but you can see them, so it's really cool. After that, you have your Assault Fire Team. Your Assault Fire Team consists of your Bosun, as well as Hive Scum Number 3, Voidborn Scum Number 1, and Voidborn Scum Number 2. These guys' job is to flank and assault through, destroying your enemy in close combat. And then, of course, you have a Big Gun Assassin, which will be your Outcast Champion. He's good at shooting, as well as clone cost, uh, close combat as well, so send him on assassination missions to take out fighters. So let's go ahead and talk about your list. Your cold trader will cost you 230 credits. This person's got a sling gun, a stiletto knife, a bio booster, as well as armor weave armor, as well as photo goggles, which will purchase for this person. They have the step aside and overseer ability. You give them the weird archetype, so that way they're a technomancer with the discipline that they'll be using, and you give them the overcharge ability, which adds actually additional strength to your attacks for your guns, which is really, really awesome. You can make last guns strength five. Just think about that. Last strength five, last guns. Terrifying. Or strength six um, sling guns, which is also terrifying as well. After that, you have your bosun who costs you 95 credits. He's got a shotgun and fighting knife. You're gonna purchase photo goggles for this guy. He automatically comes with mesh armor. He's got the dodge skill, and you're to give this guy the weird archetype as well. And you're gonna make him a technomancer as well with his discipline. And you're gonna give him the ability called manipulate lumens, which means you can either turn on or off the lights and give blackout conditions anytime you want to. So, like I said, you'll be controlling the blackout conditions, and you'll have photo goggles to help you do that at the same time. Now, your underhive out. Cast champ is going to cost you 120 credits. This person's got a Kroot long rifle uh, because the cold trader will let you have the ability to get you Xenos weapons. He's got photo goggles as well as a mesh armor. You give this guy the mastermind archetypes so that way he has the infiltrate skill so that way he can go in and be your big gun assassin, take people out with that Kroot long rifle, which you could also use in close combat too, which is really, really cool. Now, then after that, you have your Vordborn Scum number one and two. They're both equipped exactly, well, almost exactly the same. They cost 165 credits. Your Vordborn Scum number one has an auto pistol, fighting knife, photo goggles, and flak armor, while your Vordborn Scum number two has a last pistol, fighting knife, photo goggles, and flak armor. Everybody knows who Vordborn Hive Scum are. Um, they have strength five, toughness five, three wounds. So these guys will be glowing in and causing all kinds of problems. You could probably equip them with better weapons as the game progresses, like give them plasma pistols, for example, and better melee weapons they'll be absolutely terrifying after that you have uh, three hive scum hive scum number one has got 70 credits it's going to be armed with the auto gun photo goggles and flak armor so for medium to close range shooting with rapid fire hive scum number two will cost you 70 credits he's got a last gun photo goggles and flak armor so that way that guy can do longer range shooting but if you give him overcharge with that ability it makes a strength five laser gun which is really really scary and then you have your Hive Scum number three, so it costs you 85 credits. That guy's armed with a shotgun, photo goggles, and flak armor. He, once again, is giving up some close in support for medium to short range with that shotgun. And that pretty much makes up the We Own the Night Cold Traders uh, Shore Smuggling Party. Uh, make the lights go out, use those photo goggles, start causing some chaos. All right, our next list is what I like to call Whispers of the Warp Xenos Corrupted House Delac Outcast Gang. Yes, can you add any more? different things to this list. Yes, this is the most diverse list as well. So it costs you 995 credits to field it. It's a very small elite style gang and it really focuses the use of weird powers, which a lot of gangs will not be ready for. The number of weird powers are available now because of the Book of Outcasts is gonna catch a lot of new players by surprise. So use that to your ability. You're gonna use the Xenos trait as well to also recruit third arm shadows as well as aberrants into your gang. Since you're a Xenos corrupted gang, you can bring one aberrant. You can also bring in uh, shadows, which are your GB level fighters, who have third arms, which gives them really good close combat attacks, and they're able to use uh, heavier weapons as well. Really, really nice. And you also have two fire teams in this one. It basically consists of two assault fire teams, is what it pretty much makes up of. So let's go ahead and talk about what makes up this list. First of all, assault fire team number one will have the Hermaphage and Majos, which is one of the special characters from the Dramatis Persona that came out from the Book of Ruin. You also will have your Aberrant, as well as a Psygeist, your Ghost, and Shadow will move in as quickly as possible using psychic abilities to pin and suppress enemies, and you'll finish them off in close combat. Meanwhile, assault fire team number two consists of one guy. That is your Not Ghoul. Your Not Ghoul will use his infiltrate skill to infiltrate in and assassinate. He'll use Pyromancy for shooting and his Shiver Sword for close combat. So, like I said, a very small list, but very, very elite. So let's go on and talk about exactly what you have in this list. 
First of all, you have the Hermaphage, uh, Hermaphage Magos. This guy costs 335 credits. He's a special character. He's got a last pistol, razor sharp talons, hardened flak armor, a respirator, as well as you're purchasing a psychic familiar for this guy. He's got crushing blow, fearsome hurl, and spring up skills. He's also going to give him the weird archetype. And instead of using a psychic ability for this guy, we're going to give him as the commanding presence special rule, so that way he can do large group activations. And the reason why is because he automatically comes with three uh, psychic powers. He comes with hypnosis, mind control, and force blast. So you don't need to worry about that so that part's kind of nice after that you have your delac not google this guy's gonna cost you 260 credits he's got psychoteric whispers upgrade so that way you can use uh psychic abilities he's got a shiver sword and auto pistol as well as a psychic familiar so that way he gets something protected from getting shot at and reroll abilities to use his psychic abilities as well as mesh armor you're gonna give him the weird archetype once again because you got the psychoteric whispers and you need to give him the pyromancer ability by giving him flame blast which allow him to make his weapons and melee weapons flammable giving the blaze trait to them at the same time molten bolt so that way you can open fire with uh, bits of melted metal directly at your enemies as well. Very, very powerful. After that, you're going to have an Aberrant. It's going to cost 125 credits. This fighter is equipped with two fighting knives as well as mesh armor. So Aberrants are good close combat fighters. And that's the only thing you can use them for. And you're going to pair up your Aberrant with your Delac Psygeist. This guy's going to cost you 85 credits. He's got a stub gun with dum-dum rounds as well as mesh armor. It automatically comes with the Psychoteric Whispers upgrade. And you're going to give him the Zealot ability from the uh, Book of Ruin. So that way you can give bonuses to your Aberrant in close combat. So that's the reason why you want to keep these two together. After that, you have a Delac Ghost. It's going to cost 155 credits. This character's going to be a specialist. This guy's going to be armed with a plasma gun and a mesh armor, so that way he can take on heavier toughness enemies, and they, of course, a plasma gun's always good to use. And then after that, you have your Delac Shadow, which is the Juvie level fight in your gang. This person's going to cost you 35 credits. This person has a stub going dum dum rounds, and they automatically come with a third arm, so these are your, once again, your expendable Juvie fighters. Use them as such. And that makes it what I like to call the Whispers of the Warp Xenos Corrupted House Delac Gang using psychic abilities, right? So this gang really shows you how diverse you can make different gangs with the new Outcast book. All right, so this last list is called O'Malley's 69's Abomination of Bad Zone 12 Zeech Hellout Chaos Cult Outcast Gang. It's going to cost you 1,000 points. I have a viewer on my channel name is O'Malley69 is his name. And he was talking about like how you should be able to use the Abomination of Bad Zone 12 to be the leader of your gang. And technically speaking, you can. Just gave me the idea to make this list. So let's talk about this real quick. The Abomination of Bad Zone 12 automatically passes all willpower and cool tests, which means you can spam the psychic powers because this guy's going to automatically pass those willpower tests, which is really, really great. And also that means if your fighters are within range of this leader, they will never break either because he automatically passes a cool test, which means they will automatically pass their cool test as well. Very, very terrifying. Not to mention, since you're using a Zneech uh, Corrupted Gang, you get an extra weird power for your leader, and you get a 4-up war save for your cast spawn, which is what the abom abom Abomination is going to be as well. So, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Uh, basically, you have an Assault Fire team, which consists of your Abomination of Bad Zone 12, your Cult Witch, as well as Hellout Cultists number 1, 2, 3, and 7. These guys' jobs are to close in in a fight and suppress and shoot from medium to close range. And your support fire team will consist of your cult disciple, your hell occultist specialist, hell occultist number four, five, as well as six. And their job is to suppress from medium to close range. They can also solve forward and pin with frag grenades from the grenade launcher from the specialists, as well as from the disciple. And when you get a chance, also purchase smoke grenades for extra spamming so that way you can recover your advances as you're moving up forward. So let's talk about what makes up this list. First of all, you have the Abomination of Bad Zone 12. He's going to cost 280 credits. He's a special character. He's going to be the leader of your gang. He's got ferocious jaws, claws, and tentacles, and he automatically comes with heavy carapace armor as well. He's got the fearsome, true grit, and unstoppable skills. You're going to give him the weird archetype with telepathy. And instead of giving him an extra power, what you're actually going to do is you're going to give him the commanding presence ability, so that way he can do group activations. And the reason why is because when you become a Zneech gang, your leader automatically comes with the psychic power. Give them mind control, just so that way this abomination thing is like something out of HP Lovecraft convincing your rivals to shoot their own people. At the same time, it also comes with a 4 ward save because it is a chaos spawn, which automatically happens with your uh, chaos spawns when you try to decide to ally yourself with Sneech, which is actually kind of crazy. After that, you have your Cult Disciple, who's actually going to cost you 160 credits. This guy's got a grenade launcher, a reclaimed auto pistol, as well as a Chaos Familiar to protect him from harm. He's also got a mesh armor, as well as the Overwatch ability, so that way you can interrupt your opponent's uh, activation phases by opening up with grenade launchers. And then you have a Cult Witch, who's going to cost you 155 credits as well. This person's got a reclaimed auto pistol, a Cult Icon, as well as a Chaos Familiar for abilities to 
reroll willpower tests as well as mesh armor. And you give this guy the dark shield ability so that way he can give buffs to everyone's armor saves, including your leaders, as well as the munitioner skill that's going to really help out with the reclaimed auto guns that they have from primarily making up this game. After that, you have the Hellot Chaos, uh, the Hellot Cultist Specialist. This guy's going to cost you 95 credits. He's going to be equipped with a grenade launcher as well as a reclaimed auto pistol. He's going to be the specialist for your gang. And after that, you guys will have six Hellot Cultists, number one, two, three, four, five, and six. These guys are all equipped exactly the same. They'll cost you 45 credits because they're all packing reclaimed auto guns. And then lastly, Hellot Cultist number seven. That guy's going to cost you 40 credits. That guy's packing a reclaimed auto pistol. The reason why Hellot Cultists are so bare bone is because they're so cheap to replace. You really don't need to use a lot of money to spend on these guys to give them better equipment. If they survive and level up and they actually end up being good, by all means, buy them better equipment because they're Hellot Chaos Cultists. And if they die, there's always more where they came from. So O'Malley69, if you're watching this video, buddy, this part is dedicated to you for giving me the idea to actually make this list, which is actually kind of cool. So there you guys have it. Those are six different gang lists that you can make for your different outcast gangs. And there's a whole bunch of other ones you can make on top of that. We could spend here all day talking about the different lists you could possibly make. But since we've got a limited amount of time, here's your six. Go forth and make them. All right, you guys. So in conclusion, if you're looking for diversity and variety in a gang, this is the gang for you. It's even more extreme than a Venator gang. That's how much more diversity you can add to this gang, which is really, really awesome as well. And you can create some really crazy combinations and have a lot of fun with this. Like you can make chaos corrupted delegation outcast gangs, for example, or whatever the heart your heart's desire wants to be able to come up with there's so many things you can do it's absolutely insane for example i have a buddy who wants to make a slopper gang for example he wants to use the little rattling slopper that has a little tentacle monster that attacks he wants to make that his leader and make like an army of hobbit like people to just like you know run around and eat things for example there's some like insane things you can do with this outcast gang which is really really nice as well and because of that expect to see that there's no more order anymore there's only outcasts people are probably going to be playing these gangs because of all the crazy stuff that they can come up with so my suggestion to you is to actually play an outcast gang and enjoy these crazy rules as long as you can because let's face it the balance bandwagon is going to eventually come rolling into town and they're going to be crying for oh my god balance we need balance we need nerfing to take place because this is too crazy this is too insane i can't deal with it because i can't fight my opponent to beat them because i don't know how so because of that enjoy it while you still can because let's face it the balance bandwagon is going to have a heyday with these rules and with these gangs and expect to see some serious nerfing within the next six months to a year out so enjoy them while you can because they're not gonna last very long <laughs> so there you guys have it this is my impressions of how to build your very first outcast gang as always please feel free to like comment and or subscribe your guys input is valuable to us as always also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.